Hello and welcome to Purely Academic, your potentially educational podcast for the month of October 2024. My name is Jonathan Lack. I'm a film critic, PhD candidate, and I can finally say I finished my dissertation. And I'm Sean Chapman, high school English teacher by day, otaku by night, and enjoyer of a good old-fashioned fright. <laughs> And speaking of frights, we are here to learn all about Halloween, specifically the 2018 to 2022 Halloween reboot slash sequel trilogy directed by David Gordon Green. We've talked about other movies in the Halloween series and episodes of our old show, the Dearly Departed Weekly Stuff podcast, and now those conversations, much like Michael Myers, have risen from an apparent death to haunt us again. Yes, because we have talked about Halloween, and we've talked about Halloween, so today we're going to talk about Halloween and all of those are the titles of movies in our conversations because you know movie titles they're a thing uh we'll also be talking about more than just that though we'll be talking about the shitty new Joker movie or specifically Jonathan you'll be talking about it because it seems so <laughs> shitty I didn't see it um I will not. be talking about the incredible Genshin Impact 5.0 update the game Astrobot which I know we have both played and much much more on this exciting and hopefully educational episode Yes, indeed. I think it is going to be a fun one. We are one week later than planned uh, because of various just scheduling things got in the way. We're still figuring out with Purely Academic exactly, I think, when in the month it is ideal for it to land. If you guys have any feedback on that, let us know. We were thinking first Friday of every month, but this is the second episode. It's on the second Friday. Maybe we just do a weird th rotation where it goes first Friday, second Friday, third Friday, fourth Friday, and then back to first. And so the fourth and fifth episodes are really close together, but then there's a really long gap between the fifth and sixth. Who knows? And, and, and every once in a while, yeah, there'll just be that fucked up month where there's like five Fridays because it like started on a Friday, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, that 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 would be an insane, absolutely insane <laughs> way to schedule a podcast that we designed to be a like more logical podcast than how the weekly stuff had worked because it gotten too weird. Weird. Um, yeah, that would be an interesting idea. Uh, I mean, the main reason we're one week late is I just got the fucking freshman plague, you know? I mean, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a public school teacher, so that comes with certain inherent risks, like being doused in teenage germs constantly. Um, it turns out <laughs> cooties are a thing. You know, cooties are real. Uh, you know, these kids, they're just covered in grossness. And every once in a while, that grossness infects the teachers. Yeah. So, you know, kids, think, of, think about your teachers, you yes. know. Wear a mask if you're sick or something. I don't know. It's Texas. I guess I'm not allowed to say that where you are. Um, yes, you'll get you know. shot. Yeah. And, okay. And then they'll then they'll you know read a prayer from the Bible or something. I don't know. All right. Well, anyway, uh, other than that, Sean, how have you been? Other than that, you know, pretty good. This is the very long, long stretch of the fall semester. You know, the way the fall semester is structured in America is insane uh, because yeah. it's just you have like one little break at the beginning of the year, which is Labor Day. And then you go all the way until like the, near the end of October, and then you get a four day weekend. And then we get like a couple weeks after that four day weekend, you get a whole week off for Thanksgiving. And then you're back for a couple weeks, and then it's Christmas. And yes. so then you're off for two weeks. And so it's just like it's you get this huge uninterrupted stretch of just full, you know, weeks and all that kind of stuff. And then you get all these like scattershot breaks right at the very end. And then obviously then the spring semester makes sense because then you have the big spring break is right in the middle and all that kind of stuff. And spring semester is awesome. So I'm, I'm fairly exhausted from work because we're just in the heart of that and the kids are feeling it, the teachers are feeling it. But, you know, there's been a lot of fun games and stuff to play. So I've been I've been having a good yes. time with that. Me too. I've uh, I had a very busy September uh, after we recorded the last purely academic because I was putting all the finishing touches on my dissertation. And it is out now. I sent it on September 25th to my committee, and I'm doing the defense, which is where the committee reads it. And then there's there's an oral defense where we talk about it, um, which is actually open to the public. So I don't know. Follow me on Twitter if you want to attend my oral defense on Zoom. I'm curious if anyone would want to do that. I don't know if you would. Uh, but that is October 25th, so that is later this month. And in the meantime, I'm doing a shit ton of job applications and academic job applications suck because they're basically like applying to college again. Um, it's not just like, here's my resume. It's like, here's my full CV and a cover letter and my statement on teaching philosophy and my statement on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the classroom and my statement on research interests and my three letters of recommendation and my writing sample. It really is. It's like you're applying to graduate school again, but this time for a job. That's that's pretty crazy. Uh, the, how, yeah. what, what time of the day is your defense of your dissertation? Oh, I think it's noon Colorado time, so it's like 1 central. 
Okay, so because that's on a Friday, so I'll I will yeah. be working, but I can I can just I can just put it up on the board, you know, <laughs> while the kids are working. It's like, hey, you know, yeah. hey, look, this is if you want to eventually go to graduate school, this is what it looks like. Here's a, a, <laughs> someone just talking about anime for hours on end. Yeah, that's that's exactly what graduate school is, Sean. We get to just talk yes. about anime all day long, exactly. nothing else. I mean, no that's, like, that's all I can tell from what you've done. You know, you just show giant robot movies, and then you just talk about it. That's all you do. I don't know. Sounds great. It is fun. It is fun on my job applications to be like, they're like, we want sample syllabi. And I'm like, well, here's my film theory syllabi, uh, syllabus, and here is my syllabus for giant robots on screen. Please hire me. Um, I think it's a cool syllabus, so I'm happy to send it in. But, you know. Yes. Here's, a, here's a syllabus that has whatever the, the title of that insane uh, Sentai movie was that's like 15 words long. Um, oh, God, yeah. I knew it at one point, and I could say it off the top of my head. I don't think I still could. Yeah, um, I just, so I just like imagining some dean at some university looking at that and just doing a double take, like, "What the fuck did did, did was did his computer break while he was writing his resume? Like, what's happening here? Is this a Jean Luc Godard movie? It sounds yes. experimental. Yes. No, um, all right, a uh, little bit of housekeeping. I just wanted to mention there's exciting stuff going on over at Fade to Lack, JonathanLack.com. Obviously, we've got all of our movie of the week stuff, which is for paid subscribers. Subscriptions are only five dollars a month, less for students. Um, and I think the October lineup is pretty fun. We've already had, by the time this episode comes out, two movie of the weeks for October, and those are A Nightmare on Elm Street, which is celebrating its 40th anniversary, and the Zack Snyder Dawn of the Dead remake, which is celebrating its 20th anniversary, and those are both interesting to write about. Um, next week, there's a piece on Ridley Scott's Hannibal, but it's really about Hannibal the book. And why the Ridley Scott version is kind of boring, and also a little bit about Hannibal, the TV show. It's a giant, like, 10-page piece that I worked on for, like, a month and a half, uh, because it took a lot of effort. There's a piece on Terminator and Terminator 2, because Terminator 1 is celebrating its 40th anniversary. And then at the end of the month... Um, in, in anticipation of the U.S. election, which will have happened by the time we do another purely academic, uh, Mobile Suit Gundam Char's Counterattack is the last movie I'm reviewing this month, and I've, I've written most of that already, and I'm excited for people to see it because it's going to be a fun, sobering review. It's going to be interesting. You know, it's about whether or not we want the asteroid to drop. Yeah, but you know, I think that changes day by day. You know, where yeah. are you on the should should the asteroid hit the Earth spectrum? Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's it's every day I wake up and it's like, is this an <laughs> asteroid hits the Earth kind of day? Um, is this a Char day or an Amaro day, basically? Exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, but also I wanted to mention there's a piece that just went up on the site as we're recording this uh, that is really unique and really cool. And it is uh, free for everyone to read. It's not just for subscribers where this is actually a section of my dissertation that I wrote and was ultimately cut for space and, and time. And it just the section it was going to go in, it, it didn't wind up kind of happening. But I got to speak with the founders of the Dragon Ball fan site Konzenshu, which is the most impressive anime fan site there's ever been it is essentially this you know massive cool encyclopedia about everything dragon ball and i've been following them since uh, the middle school i mean a long long time the the uh, one of the impetuses for our early podcast stuff was the Daizenshu EX podcast, which was an earlier version of Konzenshu. Um, and so I was working on this section that was about sort of modern expressions of fandom and how it relates to technology. And I wound up interviewing both Mike Labrie of Vegito EX and Heath Cutler Hujio, who are the two founders of Konzenshu. And it was such a cool, you know, both talks were about an hour long. I had so much good insight from them. I'd written up this eight or nine page piece um, that was going to be in the dissertation. Again, that section wound up not materializing, but I wanted it to go out somehow. And so I did ask them, I said, hey, would it be okay if I just put it up on my site? And they were enthusiastic about that. So um, in part because this is the month I'm defending my dissertation, and in part because this is the month when literally today as this podcast goes out is the premiere day of Dragon Ball Daima, the first new show in several years and the last show that Akira Toriyama worked on. That piece is out there on my site right now. Um, it's really cool. It's again, it's a little scholarly. Um, you know, it's got a lot of footnotes, but I think it's very accessible and I think their insight is really cool. And it's, you know, talking with people who have been in the fandom, you know, even longer than you or I have been. And we're in kind of that first, second generation of fan sites and have seen it. And I just find this kind of stuff fascinating. And I don't think enough people kind of talk about that side of it in, in this kind of way. So I was happy to publish that. And I'm glad it's out there. And I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to it. Because it's a really cool piece that uh, I'm glad I got to put out in the world in some shape or form. 
Yeah, I haven't had the time to read it yet, but I'm definitely going to uh, read it this weekend. Uh, because yes, because it's I'm I'm not like an avid consumer of Kanzen Chu or its like predecessors. Um, but it's a site you know if you're if you're a Dragon Ball fan, you end up on every once in a while, kind of no matter what, just sort of by necessity, at least in the English speaking uh, realm. And it is it is cool just because like it's one of those kinds of sites slash like fan communities that has been around so long. It has like evolved with various iterations of like what the internet is and how one interfaces yes. with the internet. And so it's cool to have something a little bit more academic or scholarly that's tackling some of that stuff because it's, you know, like the internet is this kind of vast um, graveyard of dead media in lost media. <laughs> yes, kind of, it is. Despite the nature of how it works and how it exists and how it evolves um, over time. And so it's nice to have something that kind of records a little bit with the people who helped create these things. What was that and what is that experience and how has it changed? Um, because it's a thing I think about every now and again as as we get old and we become old, old men that think on our past and nostalgia and shit like that. <laughs> and like the like 90s and early 2000s internet is a thing I think about every once in a while and about how that's just like gone completely yes. forever. Um, and it's and it's kind of a weird it's a weird thing. And so I'm glad that you had that time to sit down with them and and get a cool article out. Yeah, you know, and, and it's just, Dragon Ball is the only show that has this, yeah. because I think for any other anime, you're you're stuck with, like, either Wikipedia or one of the awful fandom wikis. Um, not <laughs> awful fandoms, I mean the, the company called Fandom yes. that owns all the wikis that are generally your pretty fandom bad. Your fandom.wikia.com yeah. sites that just, yeah. like, fucking nuke your browser somehow, and you're like, yes. why does this, every website owned by this company run, like, absolute garbage? What's happening? Indeed. And versus like, you know, we're preparing a Dragon Ball GT episode for the next season of Japanimation Station. And Kanzen Shoes where I've done 100% of the research for that. Because mm. you can go there and I can find the weekly rating for every episode in Japan and find out when did Dragon Ball GT kind of start to fall off in the ratings or things like that. And it's just, it's all there. You know it's going to be accessible and accurate. And uh, there, I wish there was more of that. But that is kind of an old website kind of thing that just sadly... Kanzenshu has been grandfathered in by being around mm -hmm. for so long. You know, no one's doing this with like Kimetsu no Yaiba, but it'd be cool to have that. Yeah, because the other thing you get is you do get a lot of well translated interviews and stuff like yeah. that from like actual Japanese sources, um, which is just one of those things that every anime fan community in English like desperately needs because it's <laughs> desperately needs. <laughs> you know, it's you know, just a you know, vast field of weird, unsubstantiated rumors that just get repeated in this kind of game of telephone that has happened on the internet for those kinds of series. And of course, you know, Dragon Ball is rife with that kind of shit, regardless of the existence of Kanjinshu. But at least if you're someone who's actually like interested in wanting to cut through the bullshit, uh, Kanjinshu is like your number one stop for that, basically, for Dragon Ball. Yes. All right, Sean, let's go ahead and kick it over to our next segment. All right, Sean, it is time for our uh, monthly show and tell segment where we talk about what we've been playing, what we've been watching. We have a lot that we have to get to today. Why don't we start with the worst thing we're going to talk about today and the thing that is most recent and that is the thing that I'm going to put in, you know, clickbait of the title and everything. Uh -huh. Do you want to hear about Joker 2? I mean, not not all that much, but I mean, sure. I mean, I'll take the, the you know, the schadenfreude. I want the schadenfreude yeah. of it. So let's just take it from that direction. Well, mostly the schadenfreude I want to go with is that, let's back up a bit, and I'm only really talking about this on the podcast because when I posted my review of Joker 2, people online asked us to talk about it on the podcast, so I thought I would briefly talk about it. Uh, I hated Joker 1. Joker 1 is one of the worst movies ever made, and it's one of the worst movies I've ever paid to see. Um, it is as bad a comic book movie as has ever been made, but it inexplicably fooled people into thinking it was actual cinema. It somehow won the Golden Lion at Venice. I think we should probably shut down the Venice Film Festival because of that. That is the prize that fucking Rashomon won in 1950 that announced Japanese cinema to the world, and and eventually they gave it to fucking Joker. That should be just the end of film festivals as an idea, I think. But anyway, Joker was bad. Joker 2, I was mildly curious about because it sounded like they had some kind of idea for it. It's like, okay, we're getting Lady Gaga. She's going to play Harley Quinn. We're going to make it a musical. I'm like, all right, if, if this weren't attached to one of the worst movies ever made, that sounds like a good idea. Like if you are Warner Brothers DC, you want to make a Joker Harley movie, you want to make it a musical, and you want to have Lady Gaga be Harley, that's like a good series of ideas. Sadly, it's attached to one of the worst movies ever made. 
Finally, the movie comes out this weekend. Uh, and honestly, I might be the person least down on it because I don't think it's any worse than Joker 1. I think it's basically as bad, just in different interesting ways. Um, but everybody seems to hate it. The news out this morning, we're recording this on Saturday, October 5th, Sean, is that it has a D uh -huh. cinema score which is the lowest cinema, cinema score, if you don't know, is in the United States. It's the polling firm that basically gauges how audiences liked the movie. It is exceptionally rare for any movie to go below a B. Um, just for reference, Megalopolis that everyone was pissed off about, be, even though Megalopolis is cool, but it's a movie that's designed to piss people off. Um, got a D plus. Joker Foley Adu got a D. It is the lowest cinema score any comic book movie has ever received in the history of that polling firm. It's estimated it'll only gross about 40 million, possibly less for the weekend. The first movie did about 100 million its opening weekend. Um, it is an unmitigated disaster. Absolutely no one likes it. All the people who liked it the first time are like in uh, just askance at this. And uh, I'm happy over here because I'm feeling like the this is an Emperor's No Clothes situation, right? This is mm -hmm. the Emperor uh, for the first time around. He's standing out there butt-ass naked, but all these people are going, oh my God, his clothes are so beautiful. Give him the Golden Lion. Give Joaquin Phoenix an Oscar. And this time he's standing out there butt-ass naked and everyone is saying, wow, his dick looks weird. This is awesome. This is awful. Let's, let's give this movie a D. And I'm happy because finally everyone is seeing what I'm seeing, which is terrible, terrible cinema. And I'm happy because I didn't even watch any of these movies. I, I just sit in here, you know, like, like uh, I read your review, which I thought was a very good review, Jonathan, and your framing device for it was equating it to a car crash, which I thought was very yeah. appropriate. And that like sort of the rubbernecking of, uh, you know, you're sitting in traffic the entire time and you know there's a car crash, and you know, you know, I shouldn't be staring at the car crash like it's, you know, it could fuck up with the traffic and it slows everything down. And also, you know, it might just kind of be inappropriate to sort of ogle at someone's uh, misery. And yet when you get there, you cannot help but to look at it. Um, and I'm here I'm like, man, I just stayed home. I didn't even drive. I was just playing video <laughs> games the whole time. I'm fucking great. I didn't even yeah. know a car crash happened, basically. I, I sort of like someone told me the other day that there was a car crash. I'm like, uh, fine. Yeah. OK, whatever. Yeah, no, you're right, you're right. And uh, yeah, I don't want to talk about the movie too much. You can go read my written review. There's one thing that I didn't get to talk about in the written review because it involves a spoiler. Um, and that's what I want to talk about here, Sean, because here is why I felt compelled to rubberneck at Joker. I had no plans to see Joker 2. And then I was searching online and I saw, because this had premiered at, this also premiered at Venice, did not win the Golden Lion. In fact, it got hor universally bad reviews out of Venice. Um, but the so spoilers for the movie had been out online. So I went and read the, like, Reddit put a plot summary out there. And the ending of the movie sounded so bizarre and fascinating, I went, I kind of want to see this. And that's why I wound up rubbernecking at the movie and going to see it. And the ending, the actual ending is so much less interesting than if you just read it as a plot summary. And that's the thing that is so cowardly about this movie. So this whole film is Arthur Fleck, Joaquin Phoenix, is in prison. He's in Arkham Asylum after the events of the first movie where he shot Robert De Niro on live TV. The character, not the actor, Robert De Niro. Robert De Niro is fine. He's alive and well. Um... But uh, the, the character is dead. And so he's in Arkham. He meets Harley Quinn and they kind of love each other. But mostly she's not actually important to the movie and he's on trial. Most of Joker 2 is the Seinfeld finale. Where if you don't know, the final episode of Seinfeld is Seinfeld and friends get put on trial for misanthropy. And all the characters over the life of the series testify against them. That is what Joker 2 is. It is in a courtroom and all the characters from Joker 1 come back and explain what happened in Joker 1. It is extremely boring and it is extremely bad. The sign It's actually kind of an insult to the Seinfeld finale to make that comparison because the Seinfeld finale is divisive it's better than this anyway uh, but at the end of the movie he gets found guilty he goes back to prison and a character we've seen in the background of several shots comes up to Arthur and prison shanks him stabs him stab 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 kills Arthur Fleck Walking Phoenix is lying there bleeding out dead on the ground and in the very far left hand side of the shot in like like the top like 20% of the image it's like very small off to the side and it is in soft focus you can kind of make out the guy who stabbed him then maniacally laughing and taking the razor blade and cutting his cheeks open like the Heath Ledger Joker from The Dark Knight and so the implication is that that's the actual Joker over there and Joaquin Phoenix was just some dude who inspired the actual clown prince of crime and when I, I have to stress, when I say that interpretation, that sounds interesting. That sounds like 
it could be bad interesting, but it sounds interesting. The actual movie is just Joaquin Phoenix gets stabbed, and if you didn't know the plot point going in, it would be hard to make out on screen that the character who stabbed him is supposed to be the Joker because it happens in soft focus in the very far extreme of the frame. The weight of the frame is on Joaquin Phoenix's face as Arthur dies. Uh, so honestly, the only thing I thought sounded interesting about the movie is also a boring cop-out. This whole movie is a boring cop-out. But the whole Joker Enterprise is a boring cop-out. The first movie was just a rip-off of Martin Scorsese. This is a rip-off of nothing. It's just boring. It's also musical. No, it isn't. Well, it has I mean, songs in it that they sing, right? It has a lot of songs in it, but you could cut all of them out and it wouldn't really change anything except it would make the movie better because they make Joaquin Phoenix sing very, very poorly. He's not a great singer, but he can sing. Go watch Walk the Line. He does his own singing yeah. there. He's fine. Uh, but they make him sing very poorly and it sounds awful. But they also make Lady Gaga not do her Lady Gaga stuff. The only time she belts it out the way we know she can is over the end credits. Other than that, she's also whisper singing. I described it in my review as a mumblecore musical, and that's basically right. It's basically people mumble singing and Todd Phillips absolutely refusing to be playful or fun with the camera, which is something that I think is kind of a requirement for a musical in basically any form of the musical is to do something interesting with the camera. He cannot do it because he's a bad director. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's technically a musical, but it's a musical that's like, I don't want to, don't make me, don't make me sing. It's that kind of musical. Yeah. It just, it seems like it's a thing where they thought, well, that's like, that's a cool artsy thing, right? That, I just feel like yes. it's like, they felt like, oh, well, the thing with Joker is it's what, it's the artsy comic book movie because it looks like, you know, it's, it's ripping off Scorsese, who's an artsy filmmaker. So, so like, what's another? Which he artsy... is, he's a popular filmmaker yes. who makes hit movies, but whatever. Yes. yes. It, well, by, it, by it, the talk... casual film goer standard, uh, sure. Scorsese uh, registers as artsy, right? And I think that's their, that's their, you know, we're, we're talking lowbrow here. We're not talking to people who yeah. know what the fuck they're doing. Um, yes. And so I think they're like, oh, well, doing it as a music, that's weird. That's artsy. Um, and they didn't stop to think, like, do we know how to make a musical? Um, it, because it's just like with how kind of like bleak and um, sort of gray and cynical the first movie seemed in trailers, this movie seemed, um, it just is like, that doesn't feel like a fit for a musical. Like if you tell me, oh, a Joker Harley musical, like that sounds cool, but I'm picturing the fucking Batman animated series doing an animated yes. episode of that and that would have been fucking the, like one of the best episodes of TV ever um, or or a movie in that style like that's the thing that activates in my brain but when I replace that with Joaquin Phoenix from the Joker at least just based on the trailers I've seen I'm like well that seems like it would be exactly the thing you have described which is I'm gonna mumble my songs I'm gonna speak in a like an audible register and there's gonna be no life or pep or energy to anything we're doing and that's just gonna, you know, where there's no color or joy or exuberance in this film because it's gotta be dark and cynical and, you know, it's exploring the soul of mankind. And that's just a dour affair. And it's like, that's not, I, I'm, I'm not even a musical person, but that's not. That's not what's appealing to a fucking musical. But you understand the theoretical appeal of musicals to yes. other people, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and there are musicals that I have enjoyed. I just, it's not a genre I go out and seek um, intentionally very much. So it's just, yeah, like the notion of this group of people making a musical has always been so hilarious um, because it just felt inevitably like it would end up the thing that has ended up just based on your impression and obviously the impressions of everybody else who has seen it and hated it. Um, you know, it makes me want to like, go to the fucking theater department at my high school and grab a bunch of the theater kids and make them watch it just to see, you know, just to, just to make them stare into the abyss that if you're someone who, for whom musicals is like your whole life, um, man, this movie must be the most depressing fucking thing you've ever seen. I just want to stress that we've talked about the superhero genre dying. 2024 is the year we got Madam Web. We got Joker 2. We're getting the Craven the Hunter movie. We're getting Venom 3. The only successful one of these was Deadpool and Wolverine, which is fine, but nothing special. Um, like, this feels to me like the year where, oh yeah, it's 
over. It's fucking over. If this is what we're doing, it's done. Yeah. I'm still not convinced that that Craven the Hunter movie is not a Saturday Night Live skit. Like, it's just... It looks I, like it. Yeah, I just, I, you know, I mean, obviously the movies... I, would, I said the same thing about Madam Web, and I said the same fucking thing about Morbius. I still just, I still can't, I can't believe it. Like, I still can't believe that they're still, that Sony is still doing this shit. When there are other Spider-Man characters you could do that this would potentially work for, why are you picking, it feels like they're intentionally picking characters that you can't do this with within the realm of Spider-Man characters they could do. Um, and yeah, you're right. I think like superhero movies, they're, they're trying to kill them is just what it sort of feels like at this point. Yeah. And if, if it's a thing they're doing intentionally, it's very effective. Very effective. Uh, but if they want to bring superhero movies back, we all know what they've got to do. Say it with me. Paste Pot Pete the movie. Yes. Yes. Paste Pot Pete the movie. And it has to be in black and white. And maybe it should be a, a silent film as well. Or are you trying to tell me do you want me to talk about the Denver Silent Film yeah, Festival? I, was, I thought it, I, both that and I legitimately a silent Paste Pot Pete movie of, that's like German expressionist would be the greatest film ever made. But also, yes, it is a segue for you, Jonathan. Sure, I'll talk about this. So last weekend, uh, one reason we couldn't record last weekend is I uh, celebrated finishing my dissertation by spending a weekend at the Denver Silent Film Festival. This has been this has existed for quite a while in Denver. I have not attended before. It's been in different sort of parts of the state, uh, like different places. But now it is in concert with the Denver Film Society and their venue, which is called the C Film Center. So it was a little easier to access this year. And it was three days. It was basically one night and then two full days and they showed uh, a bunch of silent movies and they showed them specifically all with live musical accompaniment most of them being um they had a grand piano that was in the theater so obviously they had that but then there were also some that had uh some other kinds of musical accompaniment and it was really cool it's i i mean i always love watching silent cinema i always love watching it with live accompaniment i've gotten to do this several times in my life one of the people who was playing there is a pianist named hank troy who is actually very well known as a silent film accompanist um he's he is honestly the best i've ever seen do it he plays all of his scores improvised live just watching the movie and he is preternaturally good at this at like reading a movie and turning it into music on the fly which is a skill that a lot of people in you know, movie theaters would have had back in the 10s and 20s for accompanying silent films, but is obviously something of a lost art for many people. Um, and I'd known Hank Troy before because he um, played in our film history class at Colorado back in 2013 for several screenings that we did, including one of the coolest things I've ever gotten to see. We had a 16 millimeter print of Eric von Stroheim's Greed, which is a epic um sort of um masterpiece that's kind of hard to see and he played along with that um and he played at several of the screenings for the denver silent film festival so that was very cool to get to see him again and hear him do his his thing um but they were all pretty cool screenings there was one thing that kind of left a poor taste in my mouth at the end and i do want to talk about that because i think it's an interesting conversation but otherwise it was a great set of movies it was a lot of stuff i had not seen before uh the first the opening night movie was a film from 1928 called beggars of life which is a William Wellman movie. Um, and it is basically, it is uh, a film that was based on a book at the same time by someone who was sort of a, uh, someone who had been in another life, kind of a wandering hobo, became an author. It's about that kind of like, you know, 10s, 20s, pre-depression sort of hobo lifestyle. Uh, and it's basically about a girl who's played by Louise Brooks. This is probably the best movie she did in Hollywood. She's better known for her stuff with G.W. Pabst a couple of years later. Um, and she uh, is abused by this like by the person who has like taken her in she kills this guy and then she goes off on the run with this hobo and it is about their sort of adventures together and that was accompanied along with one other movie by the mont alto silent picture orchestra who are motion picture orchestra who i have taught before because on several silent films that i've taught in university they are on the blu-ray playing the score uh, so it was really cool to see them live they're a five-piece group piano violin cello um clarinet and horn uh and they're, they're they're great and their scores are just really really good the best thing they did and my favorite thing i saw at this festival was the seahawk which is from 1924 this is an amazing film it is a nautical adventure movie it there's a better known sound film remake 
with um, Errol Flynn from, I think, the 30s, but this is the original silent film version. It's based on a novel, and it is about this English nobleman named Oliver Tressilian, which is a great name, who is betrayed by his wicked brother and sold into slavery uh, to Spain. Uh, and then he winds up escaping with this group of uh, Moorish uh, Muslims, and he converts to Islam because the Christian uh, Spaniards were so cruel to him, and he becomes known to the Moors as the Seahawk and is their hero. And it is sort of like Dune or Lawrence of Arabia, but on the high seas. And if anything, less racially problematic because it's pretty straightforward about just like, these Christians fucking suck. These Muslims seem pretty cool. I'm going to go be with their friend. And uh, it's a cool movie. And it's it, 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 it reminds you that history is not a straight line because this movie would not have been made even 10 years later because the sound film remake gets rid of all that religious stuff. And I think if you were to make this today, you couldn't do it because we live in a period of massive Islamophobia. But in 1924, you could. And this movie rocks. It has, it's one of the earliest movies to do realistic sea footage, seafaring footage, like out on the high seas. And that is just fucking incredible. It's such a cool production. And then this was also Mont Alto doing the music and they did a phenomenal job. And even though this one was playing at 10 a.m. in the morning, ripe and early on a day where I had five back-to-back -back screenings, I was there for it. It was so good. Awesome. Yeah. Um, a couple others I wanted to mention. Um, the other feature that I thought was the best thing I saw is a 1929 Czechoslovakian movie called The Organist at St. Vitus Cathedral. This was a pretty rare movie until recently, my understanding is. I think the, the Czech like uh, Ministry of Culture or whatever did a big restoration of it recently, so it is now available. I don't know if it has any kind of home video release in the U.S., but it is out there somewhere. And it is a really interesting movie. Um, the person introducing it sort of compared it to other movies about sad old men in big pieces of real architecture like the Hunchback of Notre Dame and it has a little bit of that to it because it is very much about the cathedral um, but it is mostly a an incredible it's kind of funny I watched this this was back to back with the Seahawk and the Seahawk is about how Christianity sucks and then this movie the organist at St. Vitus Cathedral is the most Catholic thing you've ever seen in your life because it is so much about sin and guilt and then uh, forgiveness. And it is this like extremely Catholic arc, but it's very cool. Hank Troy did the score for that one and he had it set up where he had his grand piano and then on top of the piano, he had a keyboard and the keyboard was set to sound like an organ. So for most yeah. of the movie, he's doing a piano score, but then when the organist would play the organ, he did the keyboard as an organ. And it was a very cool way to do the score for this movie. Uh, and it's a it's a beautiful movie. It's so well made. It's got one thing when you watch a lot of silent films back to back is you remember how cool silent films were with their superimpositions and crossfades. That's a big silent film technique that I don't think we make enough use of anymore. And this one specifically has a sequence early on that I wonder if David Lynch has seen because it reminded me so much of the scene in Twin Peaks The Return, the finale, where it is the action going on at the police station and Cooper's face is just superimposed uh -huh. over the whole thing. There's a scene like that in this movie, and it is so cool and very much worth seeking out. There were some other features. There were a lot of shorts. There was a whole feature of early shorts, so stuff like that you've probably heard of, like The Great Train Robbery, um, A Trip to the Moon, the uh, Lumiere films like The Rival of the Train, all of that kind of stuff. Um, there was a very cool screening of a famous uh, Swedish silent film called The Phantom Carriage, which I do think is a great movie, other than I think it has a complete, total cop-out ending that kind of ruins the whole thing. But up until that point, it's great, and it had a really, really cool score performed by the pianist from Mont, Mont Alto, who did a great job with it. Uh, I saw D.W. Griffith's Intolerance on Sunday morning, the final morning of the festival. That is the movie D.W. Griffith made after The Birth of a Nation, the most racist evil movie ever made. If you're wondering, did he make it Intolerance because he wanted to say he was sorry for doing the most intolerant movie ever made? No. Intolerance is about how the NAACP was too intolerant of his racist movie that said black people do not deserve to be citizens. And he made this about how intolerance is an evil. I think intolerance is one of the worst movies I've ever seen. It is, I know 
it's a this is a thing that will get me kicked out of film studies for saying because it is a sacred text to film studies because the French New Wave loved it because of its bold cross cutting, but I think it is a terrible movie. It is technically sound in some ways, absolutely, as is also true of Birth of a Nation. It is in many ways just as ideologically noxious as Birth of a Nation. It just hides it a little better, but it is also stupid. It's like a really stupid movie. Like it's it just repeats the word in every intertitle intolerance over and over again and tries to make this kind of like because the whole thing with intolerance is it's set in four different time periods and it's telling four interwoven stories across time about how intolerance has been the bane of humanity um but it it tries to make it like this you know sort of like a grand unified theory of human suffering is just intolerance but it's such a simplistic like kindergartner's view of what that is and the movie is also itself wildly intolerant because there's a section about the crucifixion of jesus christ and if you think it's not didn't take the time to be anti-semitic who boy who boy if you thought passion of the christ was bad wait until you see the prosthetic noses in that section of intolerance because wow and then there is a whole section in the present day which then would have been the 1910s about the about all these you know haughty women trying to get voting rights and trying to do reform and it's about how bad they are and how if women don't stay in the kitchen and raise their kids they will do evil um it's a very intolerant movie uh, it's a very stupid movie. I don't really want to talk about it. This is my bold film studies opinion. D.W. Griffith, not as good as film studies likes to say he was because film studies has a lot of racism in it. Yeah. And that's the whole thing. I just think, like, for me, intolerance is just, it's one of those concepts that when you try to break it down, it's just like, it's not a thing, you know? Like, it's just, <laughs> it's just so when someone's trying to, like, make, because it always just ends up being, like, everyone tolerates what they want and does not tolerate what they don't like there's just no sort of someone tolerates all things is not a concept so it's like everybody is intolerant you know it's just like good people are intolerant to you know violent murder and rape and racism and awful things happening in the world i don't tolerate those things and say with that in my classroom <laughs> i don't tolerate like someone throwing a pencil across the room you know it's just like it's such a like being like, oh, intolerance is the evil of man. It's like, no, you just want people to be intolerant towards the things that you're intolerant to, and you want people to tolerate the things that you want to tolerate. That's it. It's not about tolerance or intolerance because it's an empty fucking idea. Well, also, the movie he made before this, Birth of a Nation, is about how intolerance is good. That is the point of the movie. The point of the movie is that black people should not be seen as human beings. They should not be allowed white around allowed around white women. That is a huge part of the movie. And the end, the triumphant end of Birth of a Nation, is that the Ku Klux Klan, who D.W. Griffith bought, brought back into the mainstream, there are a lot of people who were lynched and killed because of that movie. Um, they write in, they kill all the black people, and then there is an election, and the Ku Klux Klan stands outside and stops the black people from voting. That is the triumphant ending of that movie, is we got America back by making sure the freed slaves could not vote. It is a movie about the virtues of being intolerant towards black people that is the explicit textual purpose of that movie so the cognitive disconnect in turning around and then making a movie called intolerance and the fact that film studies for a hundred years has been like but we can separate these two things right it's it's technically brilliant so it doesn't matter that it's racist no i, I reject that i reject that very strongly i mean it just seems to me that dw griffith's problem is that uh, black people were just too intolerant to the idea that they couldn't vote if they just could tolerate the idea that they're not allowed to vote, it would be fine. Then the world would be <laughs> fine for D.W. Griffith. And it's, the problem is intolerance, you see? They just, they're too intolerant. It's just, it's just, it's, you know, it's fucked up. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, then the last screening I went to, I missed the very, very final screening. I did everything else. But the, the final screening I went to was a set of Buster Keaton shorts. It was One Week, Sherlock Jr., and The Playhouse. And that sounded like it was going to be very fun. They made a big mistake here. And I want to talk about this because I think it's interesting. And it, it has it soured me on the festival a little bit. There was a really big programming problem here. And it is that Ben Mankiewicz, who is the person who organizes this festival, he is well known in Colorado as a radio personality film... Um, uh, he's really like a popular film critic. I know he does some teaching at uh, DU, I believe. Um, but that's his, his basic role. He comes out, he introduces the Buster Keaton stuff, it all sounds great, and then he says, he, he leaves, and then he comes back to the front of the theater before the movie starts and says, oh, just a second, I wanted to say, I just wanted to apologize, 
I'd forgotten when I programmed this that the Playhouse has some blackface in it. And I do apologize to everyone in the audience and also to our, our pianist today who happened to be a woman named Tenia Nelson who was a black woman. And that is all he said. And then Tenia Nelson grabbed the mic because she felt she needed to say something and said, yeah, I only became aware of this recently too. Um, if I wind up not playing during those sections, I hope you understand why. It's because I don't really want to make it fun because it's a minstrel mm -hmm. show thing. And I'm sitting here going, well, this is a fucking disaster. This is not how you do this. And so the first short plays, and it's one week. That is the Buster Keaton short where he and his wife are building the house together. It's where the, the house falls on him, but he, like, falls over right. him with the window. It's the very famous Buster Keaton short. It's brilliant. Everyone loves it. We're all laughing. Sold out house. Really fun. Then the Playhouse starts. And the Playhouse is an interesting short. It has a lot of interesting sort of metatextual stuff about theater and movies. It's very Buster Keaton. It does also have a whole range of minstrelsy going on in it, um, including Buster Keaton in blackface and also a section where he is pretending to be a monkey and the way he dresses himself up as a monkey is also blackface. Right. And here's the thing. I am not one of those people who will say we should not show stuff with blackface in it. Absolutely not. I think it exists. I think it should be taught. I think it should be understood by people today. But I do think there needs to be context for it. I mm -hmm. think you cannot spring blackface on people. I think if you are going to show a movie or a short that has... And when I say blackface here, I mean the, the specific, the actual thing, the minstrelsy, right? Um, these old style minstrel shows. I think you have to make it an educational moment. I think you have to give a full-throated introduction where you explain what minstrelsy was you explain why someone like buster keaton who otherwise was not dw griffith he was not a raging like racist why did he participate in blackface you would explain the cultural context for it you would show it and then you would also hopefully have a discussion afterwards about it but i think you have to make it an educational thing i also think it is unfair to ask a black woman to play the piano for it and not... I, I, look, I don't know her. I don't know Ben Mankiewicz. I don't know the whole situation. It sure seemed to me like she was not prepared for what she was going to be accompanying because when that stuff came up, it was basically 20 minutes of everyone in the audience being very awkwardly silent because she really, I think, had trouble figuring out how to play along to this. And I'm not blaming her one bit. It's hard to know what to do with that kind of material, right? Yeah. It's hard to do your fun, happy, ha, da, 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 piano music when you've got some of these images on screen. And that is why you can't just on a whim show something like this, say one word about it at the beginning of your screening, and then kind of throw your pianist out to dry. Yeah. And that is what it felt like. And it was the most awkward time I think I've ever spent in a movie theater because it was this sold out house and a lot of people not knowing how to react Eventually that one ended and then we watched Sherlock Jr. And Sherlock Jr. is brilliant and, and is, is wonderful. And, you know, there's lots of silent shorts you can show with no introduction. One Week and Sherlock Jr., they play as well today as they did 100 years ago. There's nothing in them that's outdated. There's nothing in them that's offensive. You can show them to anyone anytime. But Buster Keaton was someone who came out of vaudeville. He did blackface. It's just a fact of life. It's, uh, you know, Chaplin never did on film. I would have to go research this again. I don't know. He probably did on stage somewhere because it was just a vaudeville thing. Um, but Buster Keaton does have films where he did blackface. And I think if you're scheduling these and you're, and you're programming them, you have to be aware of that. There's also plenty where he didn't. So if you're just programming a popular Sunday afternoon family-friendly film program, you have to pick a different short and you have to do this differently. If you are going to show one of the ones with blackface, I think you have to make an educational event out of it. And again... I am not opposed to screening them. I think the whole thing where all those streaming services like Netflix and everyone else pulled off all the episodes where people had blackface or skin darkening or whatever um, after the George Floyd stuff, I think that's idiotic and I think it's offensive. And I think just pretending something didn't happen or pretending that different forms of the same thing are all the same or that we can erase and ignore these things, I hate that. And I think that is a bad impulse and I think it is a bad impulse that the left has sometimes and I think it's a bad impulse that is rightly criticized. But I think there is the other side of it which is just springing it on people without announcement and as an academic, I think that's really, really poor practice and I definitely left this festival with a bad taste in my mouth because of it. Yeah, that seems that's pretty wild. Like, it seems... It seems crazy that you would not prepare 
that. That that would just be yes. like at the last minute you're like, ah oh, shit, that's right. <laughs> that, that, that thing does have a bunch of blackface in it. Uh I guess I'll say something. You know, not even having a pre-prepared statement for it yes. is um pretty nuts. Cause it just, yeah, it seems to me that probably the best thing to do in this context, if you're doing like a film festival, is either decide we're not going to deal with it and so don't show a movie that has that because we just don't want to deal with it, which is totally understandable. Or you do a you make a thing out of it. You show multiple examples of it and have, as you say, like um, maybe like a small panel of some academics or something like that. Obviously, hopefully some black academics in there to discuss and give context to it and then make it, as you're saying, like a more educational thing and gives you that sort of wider appreciation of the history and why it happens. Now, that's probably not the most fun thing to go see um, that your right. casual, you know, but your casual film viewer is not going to go see a fucking silent film festival anyways. Um, but even within that, that's an even more kind of hardcore um, thing to do. But I think those are kind of something like that are generally your two options. Um, just going out there and saying like, oh, by the way, uh, the blackface. Anyways, enjoy. And then just running yeah. off stage is kind of weird. It's very weird. It's, you know, and it's it's personal to me because I've been in film history classes. I've thought about how I would teach this stuff. And I've been in classes where this was sprung on me. I was in a musical class once at, at Colorado and we were watching the film Babes in Arms, which is one of the worst movies ever made, but it's a Judy Garland, Mickey Rooney musical. And I don't believe the professor mentioned this, but halfway through there is a full number where Dorothy Gale from The Wizard of Oz is in full minstrel makeup in blackface and Mickey Rooney is too. And it's shocking. And like, that's the thing, like actual blackface, the minstrel stuff to a modern audience is shocking because it's ugly and it is dark and it is like, it was made for comedy then, but I think it reads now as grotesque to a degree that is really disturbing. And I think you just need to, you need to under, you know, you need to explain because it is a lesson in how bigotry can be so casual because a lot of the people who did it didn't do it out of an explicit racial animus. It was a vaudeville tradition. But what I think that teaches is a lesson in how these things become so second nature and how culture makes us unaware of our own biases and all these things, right? So there are real lessons to be learned, but not when you spring it on people. Yeah, that's fucked up. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so that was the Denver Silent Film Festival. Sean, I've been talking for a while. Let's talk, you talk about some stuff. All right, let's talk, let's talk some video games. So... Um, so I guess one big thing that has happened since the last podcast is uh, Genshin Impact has had its next update. We are now in Genshin Impact 5.0, which uh, has introduced the next nation, Natlan, or Nata, if you're playing in with the Japanese dub, where I now have a hard time whenever they change proper nouns to things to remember, like, which one is in which one. Um, but yes, so... Um, actually, I'll, I'll use a segue from that because there is one controversy around Natlan that is not new to Genshin Impact, certainly if you've played the game, um, because it also came up in Sumeru, which is um, the depiction of people of color, specifically people of dark skin. Um, so Natlan, I'll say overall, I think this update is fantastic. Like I think as like a game and a story that it's telling, it is as good, if not better, than most stuff Genshin Impact has done. Um, and I think it's obviously perfectly fine to enjoy those things. And then also recognize that there is a colorism issue um, really kind of deeply embedded in Genshin Impact and lots of games of Genshin Impact style. It's true of Hoyo versus other games. It's true of lots of um, gotcha games in particular where they will represent people of color, um, people of darker skin, but do it with, um, let's say, slightly darker skin is kind of the approach they take. So Sumeru had... Um, the north, or the the desert region that was obviously loosely based on North Africa, um, specifically Egypt, and you had some characters like Dicia or Dia, I guess in the English dub, um, native to there, or Sino, and some of those characters who are characters that have darker skin, but are the the issue with colorism is the sense of they can have darker skin to sort of register as being people from this sort of foreign region, but not dark skin that it's actually dark. Um, so as not to alienate a colorist audience um, in whichever nation, right, in China or uh, internationally that might have um, certain kind of like biases in terms of human appearance and beauty related to skin color. So Natlan has the same issue here because Natlan is a kind of composite nation of different regions of South America and different regions of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and it's actually like it's pretty interesting the blend they've gone through too, because there's kind of different groups of people that live in different sections of the region, and each one has its own kind of cultural root. 
Um, and you see it reflected in the, the visual elements of the game, but also in the music, which is fantastic here. And there's a lot of really great blending of different kinds of African instruments and different kinds of South American instruments that create a very like unique music that obviously still has its fundamental base be Western Symphonic Orchestra, which is what the base is for all of Genshin Impact's music. So you've got a lot of music that has um, choral elements that are uh, sung in Swahili, which is very cool. Um, and then you have lots of music that has lots of um, different kind of woodwinds that very, you know, like kind of pan flutes and stuff like that, that you might be used to from hearing and like Peruvian bands and things like that. And it's a really fantastic soundtrack. And in those areas of the game, in terms of the visual elements, in terms of the music, there's clearly a huge dedication to research into these specific regions that I've like watched different sort of people from these places react to different elements of the game and be like, oh my God, this piece here or the way that this instrument is played here the way they did this music is so incredible so it's always very frustrating then when you see that they have to sort of um lighten up so many of the characters skin color so that again they are noticeably darker than the other cast and yet they are not as dark as they obviously should be if they're based on um regions of sub-saharan africa and stuff like that so that's an issue that i want to kind of you know forefront up at the top with this um again it's not new to genshin impact um, so that, that is always kind of a thing that's a little bit frustrating about, um, uh, this section of the game, but there is so much to enjoy here with Genshin Impact 5.0. The story that they're telling here is really fascinating. The, the nation of Natlan is one that, um, is composed very differently than the other nations in the game. So it's this kind of like much looser group of different people who had kind of all come together and they're... Um, they their nation of fire, and so the whole setup for this nation is that they have um, been fighting the abyss, which is kind of like the evil faction in Genshin Impact for hundreds of years. They're kind of at like the front lines of that conflict, which has been kind of in the background of Genshin Impact for most of it. So when you go to Natlan, so much of their culture is about how do we kind of come together as this larger group to fight off this like insidious uh, force that is kind of formless and shapeless and is trying to invade our world. And there's this very interesting thing where they go into the abyss and fight it as like these kinds of groups of heroes. And then if heroes die in the abyss, they have this song of resurrection that the pyro god uh, Mavica is in charge of that they kind of bring the soul back from the abyss to um, sort of our world and then uh, resurrect the person and bring them back to life. And so their whole culture is about this kind of ongoing uh, war where heroes from different tribes are selected. They go and fight the abyss. When heroes fall, they are brought back to our world. Um, and it gives this really interesting kind of very different, almost kind of epic poetry vibe. It definitely has like shades of almost like the Iliad there in terms of like my experience of stories that I've read that it gets into this sort of the, the underworld and the soul and what it is it to be a hero in this sort of much bigger sense of the world and how that reflects the history and culture of all these different people who all must work together to fight against this thing. And the kind of inciting incident of the plot is that you meet this character Kachina who is um, this sort of like younger character who um, has these like aspirations to be a hero, but lacks a lot of confidence. You help her gain that confidence. She goes and fights in the tournament, wins the tournament, is selected as one of the heroes to go. She goes and fights. While she's gone, you're going and hanging out with some of the other characters in that land. And then when the group of heroes returns from the abyss, um, you learn that Kachina has uh, fallen in that battle. So they hold the ritual to resurrect her and the ritual fails. And so you have to go to the underworld to go find her soul and bring her out. And so it's just this very interesting story that gets into some like darker material than the main storyline in Natlan has done so far. Or sorry, the main uh, storyline in Genshin Impact in general has done so far. Um, and there's a lot of really cool stuff around Mavica, the uh, Pyro Archon or Fire God, where she is a human who has been put into this position where all the fire gods are people who have risen up and are kind of like the top hero of Natlan for that generation. So it's just dealing with very different themes, as you would expect um, for Genshin Impact. Every time it moves to a new region, it deals with new things, a whole new soundtrack, a whole new visual identity. And then one of the other things that's really cool about Natlan is well, new characters are all designed around movement ability. So a big focus is building out their kits where their abilities are around how they move around in the world. 
So like one of the characters, Mulani, um, has like this little shark surfboard she rides on. So you can use her skill. She gets on the surfboard and it increases her movement speed dramatically, especially when you're on water and you kind of surf around the uh, battlefield and mark enemies that you pass through and then do these big hits that do huge amounts of damage. But you can use her surfboard just to navigate and explore the open world. Um, Kachina has her um this little like kind of egg band from sonic looking little top thing she rides around in that is cool and like will climb up cliffs and the other character that's the most recent character is kinichi um who is who has a grappling hook ability so he can kind of swing around almost like spider-man from old spider-man games where the web didn't hook to a building but it's just kind of like hooked into the uh, sky and you swing around um he can do that which is fucking cool as shit and kinichi is voiced by um, blanking on his name, but the voice actor who voices Sasuke in Naruto, he's also Shiro in the Fate series, and then he's got a little dragon buddy because it's also the the, na- the land of dragons, so there are all these little kind of dragon guys running around, which are cool. But his little dragon buddy is voiced by Takichi Jinko, who's the voice for Naruto. So you have Sasuke and Naruto pair basically as one character, um, and so that's a lot of what I've been doing is swinging around as Kinichi and doing my daily missions and stuff like that. So yeah, obviously it has, it's sort of some of those kind of issues that Genshin Impact has had. I wish that they would kind of broaden their um, perspective on what they would do for their character designs and kind of push into this place where I know that a lot of like character art that leaks from like development has these characters with darker skin color. And then when they actually come to putting them in the game, they all end up getting lightened across the board. I really, really wish that they would avoid that because it puts a, uh, you know, a cloud over all this other stuff that's so cool. At the same time, though, I do think this is a fantastic update overall, and I'm very excited to see where they go in the story and what crazy new movement shit they do with other characters, because the way that the movement powers alter the way you interact with Genshin um, is probably the most dramatic update they've done since Sumeru, where they added uh, Dendro as one of the elements, which really kind of changed the way you saw the game. Um, there, particularly in terms of combat. Here, the way that your movement abilities affect your exploration really kind of changes the way you look at and see the world of Genshin Impact in some pretty fundamental ways. And so I've been having a lot of fun running around and doing my Genshin shit. Nice. I know my brother's been enjoying this update too a lot. I fell off Genshin a couple of years ago because there's just a lot of it. This is, Genshin's a big game. It's a very it's, big game. It is a very, but... very big game, and it's always getting bigger. But I'm glad you are enjoying it. I mean, it sounds awesome, and I'm I'm excited. And you know, one day one day they'll put the um God, what's his name, the Kenji Otsuda character, Dane Slave, who is Dane Slave. One day they'll make him a playable character, and I'll have to come back for that. So yeah, there's there's been some wild shit that's happened in the interim chapters where basically in between updates they always do a Dane Slave one where you get another story mission with yeah. him. So there's some shit. There's a lot. A lot has happened with the like main storyline between the twins, the two travelers. Um, and, and all that stuff has been very cool. Um, there have been some very cool music videos they have done that are animated music videos. You know, Genshin Impact continues to be one of the sort of most luxurious productions around, particularly in terms of that kind of external fan media with the trailers. And they there's a whole AMA song they did that's really sick They're for the fourth anniversary, which is where we're at now. Um, they did a music video that they hired a popular musical artist in China, America, and Japan to do three different versions of this one song for three of the different languages. I don't know why they didn't do one in Korean, because that's the other dub that there is in Genshin Impact. But maybe they just sort of realized it's a lot of money to hire really popular musical artists in three different languages. So doing a fourth one, maybe like we can't quite go there all the way for the Korean one. But um, Genshin Impact is pretty wild in terms of its, its continued uh, kind of insane success. Well, maybe there will just be a region of the game that they go to that is styled as South Korea, and you will have K-pop as the new element that you use in the game. Well, well, next year we're getting Snezhnaya. This is the this is the second to last nation of the sort of original seven that they laid out. So we're getting like weirdly close to the sort of end of the original sort of roadmap or whatever. Um, so yeah. you know who knows after that who the fuck knows with Genshin Impact. I'm so curious. You know, we've got a whole year of Natland, so obviously we're, we're certainly not there yet. But after that, who fucking knows? Maybe we go to actual South Korea. Who knows what happens after you get to the end of the Seven <laughs> Nations? I have no idea. Awesome. What else have you been playing, Sean? And what else have maybe I been playing? Oh, that's an interesting question, Jonathan. Well, I think we both have uh, played uh, the shit out of Astrobot, the newest Astrobot game 
made by Sony, featuring Astrobot, everybody's favorite bot, who's named Astro. Um, so yeah, this is the big PS5 exclusive, came out early September. Um, obviously a follow-on from um, Astro's Playroom, which was the pack-in game for PS5, which is the very specific follow-on here. It's, it's you know, yeah. it is that is the foundation of this game. Obviously, he also had his VR game where Astro kind of made his big debut. Uh, but if you played the pack-in game for PS5, Astro's Playroom, and you thought, man, it'd be cool if they made a whole big game out of this, and that would be maybe one of the best games on the PS5. Well, guess what? They made a whole big <laughs> game out of it, and it is one of the best games on the PS5. I mean, Astro Bot is so good, and it's part of... I honestly think this is part of why the PS5 Pro announcement landed with as much of a thud as it did, is they happened to release maybe the most, like, cool-looking, next-gen feeling game Sony's first person studios, first party studios have made for the PS5 yet, the week they announced the PS5 Pro, and Astro Boy just is such a luxurious package, because it is... It is basically Super Mario Galaxy 3. Like you said, the basis of it is Astro's Playroom, and I was going to say the basis of it is Super Mario Galaxy, but um, but it is it is that kind of like big, ambitious 3D platformer. It is in structure Mario Galaxy. In gameplay, it takes a lot from Mario Sunshine, and then it has a lot of its own little ideas too. Um, but, you know, Mario games are on Nintendo systems where they are more graphically... Um, I don't want to say limited because I think those games are beautiful, modest. but they're more modest. Yeah, modest is the right word uh astrobot is a you know giant triple a 4k unbelievably luxurious looking game that is using the dual sense controller to its absolute maximum in every level and it is it is beautifully designed it's really well done i think if you're someone who has been keeping up with all of the mario games over the years it doesn't feel as fresh as it could i definitely felt by the last two galaxies or so that like its bag of tricks was a little too limited and a little too derivative of Mario games. And I would like to see a sequel where I think they branch out a little bit more beyond that paradigm because, you know, I don't think this is a better game than Mario Galaxy or Mario Odyssey. And I think those games have more variety ultimately to them. But as a first effort from Team Asobi to a big full $60 AAA 3D platformer in an era where basically only Nintendo makes those games still, fuck yeah, this game rocks. Yeah, and as someone who's not a big platformer guy, which is me, right? Like, it's one of the reasons why I don't own Nintendo platforms really is because I, I tend not to gravitate towards your um, kind of platform games, particularly in terms of 2D platformers is more the thing I, I'd end up kind of falling off of. Uh, there is something about Astrobot that's really nice about having, one, just like having it on a PlayStation console, but there's something nice about having a platformer that is pushing some of these things that like, particularly with the DualSense that the PlayStation 5 can do to give this sort of very purely tactile experience, which is one of the yes. things I enjoyed so much about it. There's this sense of like, as a platformer, it's fairly simple, but by design, because it's very much a like, you are running around and you're having this very kind of physicalized experience as the character of Astrobot in the world. And so it's so much more about like you having this tactile experience of walking and having the controller vibrate and create sounds that match, you know, all the stuff that Playroom did of like, if you're walking on glass, it sounds like you're, and feels like you're walking on glass. If you're walking on ice or in through snow and all those kinds of things, all the effects, the sound designs, the graphic, um, design the controller rumble and the controller uh, speakers, all those things are working in concert to create this really kind of consummate unified aesthetic and kinesthetic experience. Um, and that's true of like kind of every element of the game. And it's true of all the different power-ups because, you know, there's a whole range of different power-ups that most levels are kind of themed around um, that all have that sensation as well. Like my favorite are the boxing gloves and just using the triggers to pop, 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 pop or like grab things and throw them around. Um, and they use the triggers and all these different pieces to make those feel very physical. But it's also the way to design the world and just fill it with little fucking physics doodads and gooey fluids and all this kind of stuff that your character interacts with, with such a great level kind of cartoon fidelity, right? It's this sort of using the technology of the PS5 not to make the graphics the most, you know, ray traced, splendorous, like, you know, oh, like if we zoom in, we can see every individual hair and pore on this person's face. That thing you can, you know, that stuff can be very cool for a game like The Last of Us that wants really high fidelity human characters to do what that game wants to do. But there's too many games that that is the thing that they go for. 
it's nice to have something else that is at this level of technical sophistication that is using that technical sophistication to say, what if we just put just a million diamonds in this fucking pyramid level? Yes. And what if we just kept pouring more and more and more and more in? And just it's just an endless fucking stream of diamonds that are little shiny diamond objects pouring from the sky that bounce off of each other and you run through and you can punch and you can do the spin attack and all that kind of stuff. It's just this giant fucking play box world that you jump around in and that kinesthetic experience is so pure and so singular. There's just no other, because there's no other console that has had this specific kind of set of technology in the controller and in the device to render all this stuff. There's just no other game that does this exact kind of experience in that way. And that's something that, um, while maybe it's not pushing the boundaries as a 3D platformer in some other ways, just as like a pure experience, it definitely feels very unique. I completely agree with that. And that is the thing that, like, I think you combine that with very smart sort of overall gameplay and level design where I really like the format of it. I like that mm -hmm. you have your hub world, a literal hub world, yes. where you where the PS5 system has crashed and all of your bots go back there. And then every individual level has a certain, like, ex and this is also very taken from Mario, of, like, your expected number of things you're going to find in the level, but you'll often find them in unexpected ways. And so there's a really good rhythm to it that is consistent. A lot of the individual levels just feel like very big, Big, sumptuous three course meals in and of themselves you know there's the ones like where you stop time or you go slow motion or the various powers that he gets that are just so fun to play with um, and they really explore those ideas very well and I think that combined with all the tactility you're talking about Sean yeah it's it's a game that you find yourself really kind of at one with it is very pure it is very full it's you know the rare playstation game that i want to play with my tv speakers on instead of headphones because i want to hear what's coming out of the speaker on the controller and i want to kind of feel all of that and yeah it's it's really cool um and and i you know just talking about the graphics this is what I like in graphics. Like, that's the thing that... This is part of why the PS5 Pro doesn't appeal to me, is because uh, you make Final Fantasy VII Rebirth look as good as you fucking want. I kind of don't care. I am so much more impressed by something like Astro Boy. I am... Or Astro Bot. I'm, it's one letter off. Yes. It's one letter off from the most famous anime ever made. I'm sorry. I'm going to call it Astro Boy just, sometimes. You know, just replace Astro Boy in your head with Tetsuan Adam, and then you're good. Then you won't yeah. make this okay. mistake. Anyway, Tetsuan Bot, I think, is a great <laughs> game. That, <laughs> no, but, like, this is the thing. I look at this game and my jaw is on the floor because I yeah. think the way it uses... And it's a lot of things Nintendo does as well. But, again, Nintendo doesn't make a big 4K 60 FPS. Well, they do a lot of 60 FPS, but they don't make their big 4K console like this. And seeing, like all those amazing colors and the big metallic sheens on everything and the way water ripples and all of that stuff like and the amount of detail you can cram on screen like I, the diamond one is definitely the most notable in terms of let's see how many diamonds we can put on screen before we tank the frame rate and that the, turns out it's infinite because this yes. game is rock solid um, but all of those things like I really love when you embrace an aesthetic that is not realistic that is cartoony that is fun that is, is so inherently playful um, and this is also why I cannot get on board with the critiques of this game is soulless because it has Sony IP in it. It's such a it's so obviously a toy box. It is so yeah. obviously celebratory. It is so full of detail in every corner. Um, there is, you know, if you want to make a Nintendo comparison there, there is a lot of Smash Brothers in it, I think, in mm -hmm. the way it kind of shows love for the different pieces of game iconography and encourages you to just think back fondly on, you know, games you've loved or learn about games you'd never heard of or something like that. Um, and yeah, so this is the kind of graphics that blows me away. And I think it's just one of the absolute best looking, playing, sounding games on the PS5. It is it is a game that I think in part because of the controller integration, but not just because of that, feels truly next gen when you sit mm -hmm. down to play it. You know, if you're wondering like, what is a PS5 game versus a PS4 game? This is a PS5 game. Yeah, and I think one of the things graphically it just does so well is it's got a very, you know, sort of cartoon aesthetic but it does a good job of using a kind of modern graphics capabilities of making things look like real objects, right? Um, that like Astrobot's a little cartoon robot man, but there's a real physical sort of texture to him that like if you zoom in on his model, he, it is reflective. It's not ray tracing. Eh, who gives a shit? You know, it's like it's not a big deal that yeah. it's not re reflecting the exact environment around him at every single second. But they're like little smudges and little uh, 
like scratches on his little robot body and stuff like that. And it's true of all the objects in the environment that they're cartoonish, but they have the kind of physical based properties and kind of physical material rendering that, you know, our kind of graphic engines these days are so good at that I think is one of those things that really sets it apart. And obviously Nintendo has started to do that as well. in like the Wii U and the Switch era going to HD of where, you know, you can see some like, you know, stitching on Mario's jeans and stuff like that um, or his overalls. But this just pushes that to this other level because it's the, it's the kind of thing where you just so rarely see a game of this art style pushed th to this like extent in terms of how it's rendered and executing that art style. Um, that when I watched the Digital Foundry video, which is a great one by John Linneman, that just is a great celebration of the whole like aesthetic in um, kind of video game presentation of Astrobot. He sometimes would intersperse it with footage of Super Mario Odyssey. And that's a game that I think looks really good on its own right. But when you see a similar kind of art style that you see how much generation, generationally in terms of technology those games are apart when you look at them back to back. And it's like, fuck, it's like, Jesus, like I, it does make you really wish that Sony and Microsoft, who obviously owns every other video game developer on the planet, like that these companies would you know, try to push more for this kind of stuff, especially because it seems like Astrobot, we don't have like detailed sales figures, but this game seems to have sold very well. It's obviously nowhere near as expensive as making a Spider-Man 2 or God of War Ragnarok. It's not that, you know, this is a relatively modest team size of like 80 something people by modern game development studio standards that's very small. Um, and so it's really just cool to see something like this. And it feels encouraging that it seems like Sony is broadly pushing this direction with games like the Horizon Lego game that hopefully will kind of continue to get more like this. Because I think Astrobot just sort of shows that there's an untapped world here that outside of the, the of Nintendo's playhouse. That's like Nintendo obviously can do this stuff, but other stuff can do, other people can do this and have a lot of success as well. Um, and can do things here because it's on the PS5 that the Nintendo can't do there. Obviously, Nintendo can do things on the Switch that the PS5 can't do. Um, it's just nice to see this kind of other side of Sony first party that you don't always get these days. Well, you don't. If we don't get nearly enough of it, and that's if there's anything that's a downside to all of the sort of Sony IP integration in here, it's seeing all these series they don't make anymore. Or I don't so much mind if they don't make them that aren't accessible on the PS5. Like that is where I would sometimes get frustrated to see a character and be like, ah, oh, how can I play this person's game on my PS5? You either can't or you have to sign up for PS Plus, Premium Plus, whatever right, yeah. the fuck it's called, the most expensive tier, and then maybe it's there. You know, or it's like, oh man, remember when Naughty Dog made games that weren't about brutally murdering people and their dogs? Ah, oh, I remember that. That was great. I want more like that. Like Sony has this rich, you know, Sony did start as much more Nintendo-esque in terms of the range of franchises and characters they had. And I I like what they started doing in the PS3, PS4 era of where they basically became the HBO of gaming, where they would make these very bespoke prestige video games for adults. And like, th there's, there's a lot of very good ones of those. We talked about one earlier in Ghost of Tsushima that I absolutely love. But I feel like a balanced diet needs more than that. And I think it's been nice to see in recent years, not just Astrobot, but I think Spider-Man fits in this as well, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now it's an outside IP, but it is a big family-friendly, you know, fun, silly game that has a lot of platforming in it. And I really hope Astrobot just indicates to Sony that there's they can do all their, you know, nice HBO kind of style games over here. But I think the people also very much want, not just kids, but I think families and adults and, and the kids inside us want stuff like Astrobot as well, because it's delightful. And that, you know, tactility of this game is kind of the basic level of what video games are. You know, it's kind of like watching an old, just to, to connect it to something, an old silent comedy and going like, mm -hmm. movies should do this kind of stuff more. This is great. This is inherently cinematic. And we don't want to get too far away from it. Yeah, or like it. Yeah, we want like that will always be a thing that is also developing at the same time. One of the things that's interesting with Astrobot is obviously you know, you've got your, all of your little like sort of cameo bots, which I do love. Like I, I, you know, I know that some people are like, oh, it's just nostalgia, of whatever. But it's like nobody fucking minds this nostalgia anymore, you know. So it's like it's nice to have a little bit of nostalgia around these things that you know, like I don't need them to continue to make fucking Sly Cooper games. You know, it's like they made their Sly Cooper games, they finished them out, like that's fine. Um, and you can play those. They did make a collection of those. So it's like, but like, it's nice to have something that's like, oh, you know, bring this back a little bit, you know, that like Nintendo obviously is like constantly mining its IP 
um, for that over and over and over again, which is fine. It's nice to have something that sort of like looks at some of these other games. But one of the things that it sort of made me realize I'd never really thought about because it never was kind of laid out in front of you is how different Sony's history is from Nintendo, just in the, the sense of like so much of the IP that you associate with the PlayStation is not really Sony IP, right? Like Sony doesn't own Crash Bandicoot. They, you know, they, they, Naughty Dog was a first party studio for a couple of those Crash Bandicoot games, but Universal owned that. And then now, I mean, fucking now Microsoft fucking owns Crash Bandicoot because yeah, Microsoft owns everything now. Um, but there's like, you have like Symphony of the Night is in here. Um, obviously the best uh, cameo bot is no doubt Kiryu bot. Um, from Yakuza, who stands there and you punch him and like a stamina X falls out in a Mahjong board. That is like the best joke in the whole game is all the random Yakuza shit that Kiryu has in his pockets is so funny. But it's like, here's like Legacy of Cain, which they now announced that remaster for those games at the state of play. And here's just this whole huge list of all these different kinds of games that are like... They have all the Persona characters. They have Igus, yes. Teddy, and Joker, which is really funny. And Teddy will like fall into the TV if you kick him. Yeah. And that's really fun. Yeah, like the vast, vast majority of the Astro Bot cameo bots or whatever in this game are not like games that Sony ever owned or Sony right. ever owned the studios that made them. They are just like game franchises that by association, partially because like, you know, in the PlayStation one days in particular, video game development was a totally different thing. And there was not the same kind of multi-platform development was not uh, like that was not really set in stone until the PS3 era. And that kind of multi-platform environment developed over the course of the PS2 era. So just by necessity, there are lots of franchises that just ended up kind of being Sony franchises or franchises that maybe Sony kind of marketed pretty heavily and stuff like that. And so it's interesting to see this like, Right. Sony does just have a very fundamentally different relationship to the IP associated with the PlayStation brand than Nintendo, because Nintendo, there are games that you associate with Nintendo, like, you know, the classic Castlevanias that are not Nintendo owned properties. But the vast majority of things you see in Smash Brothers are things that Nintendo owns. It's not until you get to Brawl and the post Brawl Smash Brothers games that they really started to have to go outside that um, environment to start filling out the roster with more characters. Um, so it just like it made me kind of appreciate how video games have changed and how like video game franchises have changed over the years to see like, right, like Sony is Sony doesn't have the same kind of history as Nintendo. And therefore, their history in the video game space is like inevitably connected to the nature of the business as it changed for the PS1, PS2, PS3 to PS4 generation and how less common it was for you to have a huge range of studios making original IPs for your thing. And instead it was more about partnering with external developers to bring multi-platform games to your console or that kind of stuff. Um, and so it's just like, it's a, it's a really interesting kind of like mirror to hold up to the video game industry to have the Astrobot does and make you kind of reflect on all these different properties and these different characters and where they have been, if they're still, why they are gone, if they're still around, how are they still around and who is making them? It's just a pretty fascinating thing in, in that respect, which is obviously well outside just the joy of running around and spraying a little tree sapling and then turning to a giant tree that sings to you while you play the level. You know, all that shit is amazing, but there's like a, a different kind of experience I think you also have with Astrobot because of its relationship to the PlayStation brand and this very different kind of nostalgia. Yeah, and I think this is another thing that, you know, I think Sony lost the plot on for a while there of of celebrating their own brand and how much mm -hmm. there's been and, like, getting games on the platform. And I think they've been better at it. You know, the PS5 being backwards compatible, I don't love how they've done their presentation of classic games on the PS5 with the price of the subscription, but it's a step in the right direction, at least, you know. So hopefully this also just animates more interest in, like, yeah, let's just celebrate the whole thing that this has been, because it's big and varied, and it's not just the, you know, HBO-style prestige games that we show in our logo at the beginning. You know, there's lots and lots of stuff. But Astrobot, two thumbs up. It's... it. It is one of, if not the best game I've played this year. I haven't sat down and made that list. Obviously, like, Yakuza 8 is a great game. There's some other really good games I've played. But yeah. Astrobots, it's up there. Well, can I tell you about the best game I've played this year, Sean? Sure, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it's it, a game that might show up on my list this year, even though I didn't play it this year. But yeah, go ahead. 
Well, I finally finished this weekend Tsukihime, A Piece of Blue Glass Moon, which is the first of two planned remakes of the classic visual novel Tsukihime that launched Type Moon uh, to fame before they then made, you know, Fate Stay Night and Fate Grand Order and all the things. Well, I guess they don't make Fate Grand Order, but they work on it, you know, um, and they get the money from it. And Tsukihime, you know, we've talked about uh, Type Moon a lot. We did a whole Japanimation Station season on Garden of Sinners and Fate's Day Night adaptations that UFO Table did. We talked about Witch on the Holy Night, which is the visual novel that got a re-release recently um, for, for English-speaking uh, audiences as well. And then this year, the Tsukihime remake, A Piece of Blue Glass Moon, which was published in Japan in 2021, right? It's a couple yeah, years ago so, now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, got a, a full English release this year. So three years late, but hey, better late than never. I have finished Tsukihime, and by finishing it, I mean I've played every route, every ending, every scene on the flowchart. Yes. I got the other side of Red Garden teaser that you can only get by seeing everything, so I completely 100%ed this. And holy shit, it is one of the best things I have ever played. We can put off the is a visual novel <laughs> yeah. video game debate for another day, whatever. If you, it's it's on the Nintendo Switch. It's it's a video game esque thing. I used a controller, and if you consider it that, it is my favorite game of the year. It is such an extraordinary work of art. I, it's kind of funny, Sean. I was re-listening to our discussion on the Witch on the Holy Night remake recently, the podcast we did, and in that discussion, you had started playing the Tsukihime remake, and we were talking about what a lush production Witch on the Holy Night was, and you said like, and the Tsukihime remake is really good, but like it's it, even it isn't quite as big as Witch on the Holy Night. I don't think you had seen the true ending yet, where no, they go. I, I I would still actually stand okay. by that statement. I do think that because of I, the the density of Witch on the Holy Night, I still think that that has more lush overall production values. Obviously, yes, there is some crazy shit that happens in Tsukihime, but Tsukihime has lots of scenes that are more sort of generic presentation. Yes. And that's kind of would be what I, I think that's probably what I meant by that topic. That, by, what I meant no, 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 I, I said think that at the time. That is what you meant. All I'm saying is there are heights in Tsukihime that yeah. are as big as anything in Witch on the Holy Night. Like there are stretches of this that are like, a step away from being fully animated. It's insane. Like, the Tsukihime, A Piece of Blue Glass Moon, very much feels to me like, we have fake Grand Order money now. Yes. We're going to put all our chips in on making the most insane, ambitious thing we can make. Because, yes, like, scene for scene, Witch on the Holy Night is more bespoke. But Tsukihime has a like a, a reach to it and an ambition that is truly mind-boggling when you see it all in order. And it, it really blew me away. I think it's a phenomenal story. It's got some of Kino Konasu's best writing. You can definitely feel, I think, how he's grown as an author, too, between mm -hmm. the different poles of his career, because this is the most recent thing he's he's done, um, other than certain fake Grand Order stuff. But Tsukihime, like, it's, it is a... Calling it a remake is kind of wrong. It's a remake yes. in the way Rebuild of Evangelion is a remake of Neon Genesis Evangelion. It's a very from-the-roots-up rethinking of the thing. And I think the thing that impressed me most is it does a similar thing to Fate Stay Night, where Fate Stay Night, I haven't played the visual novel, but I've seen the anime and you've told me about it, is it's three routes, but you have to play them sequentially. So you yes. do the Saber route, you do the Unlimited Blade Works route, you do Heaven's Feel, and they all build on one another. And I think A Piece of Blue Glass Moon, it does a very similar thing in that there are two routes, and they are broadly labeled the Arcade route and the Seal route, but you have to play the Arcade route first, then you can play the seal route, and once you finish that, then you get a true ending of the seal route. But I think just describing it as two routes with two heroines is completely misleading, because what yeah. it's actually doing is you have the arcade route, which is, from my understanding, fairly close to the original visual novel, although there's a big change with uh, the character Vlav here yes. subs in for a different character there. But it's a little closer, it's much smaller in scale, it's very intimate. And then the seal route is basically twice as long as it, and saying it's the seal route is kind of wrong because it's also the arcade route again. And when you get to the true ending, it is a true ending, whether that be a happy ending or merely a dramatically satisfying ending for every major character in this half of the game. And when you get to the end of it, you realize, oh, okay, this is not two alternate versions of the story. It's not like this is the version with Arcade, this is the version with Seal. It's one big story that is told in two uneven halves where you have to see this alternate potentiality to then inform the themes of the main, the, what the real story of the game is, which is in the Seal route. 
And it's very similar to what I remember when we jumped from Unlimited Blade Works, Fate's Day Night, to Heaven's Feel, where you go, oh man, Unlimited Blade Works felt pretty complete, that felt pretty compelling. And then you see Heaven's Feel and go, oh, we were looking through a, through a keyhole at the bigger story of this thing. But I think it's even more stark in Tsukihime, in part because it is so concentrated. And you get to the ending and like, it is so powerful. And I think the way it pays off on really, truly every character on the, they're called the near side stories, but the vampire side of the cast, how it pays off on all those characters down to the level of like the nominal villain of the game, Roa, has some of the most compelling character development in the end there. And you do not see that coming. Um, it really blows me away. It is such a powerful use of the visual novel medium. You know, Nasu is consistently doing things in here that the visual novel is the only way you could do it. If you did it in pure text, you wouldn't be able to quite hint at the insanity of the thing he is claiming enough. And if you did it just in animation, animation alone cannot suggest the, the vastness of something that text can, but you put a little bit of them together in a visual novel, and there are parts of this that just will break your brain open, uh, particularly in the true ending where Arcade goes, um, becomes like a fucking god. Yeah. It's well, insane. That's, yeah, when you, when you understand why she's called the true ancestor. Yes, the true ancestor. But I, I love it. It's such a cool story. It's such a cool game. And and one thing I just want to stress, because I'd actually seen several people in my mentions on Twitter confused on this. Don't be scared away by the part one thing on this. Right. Tsukihime, A Piece of Blue Glass Moon is a complete experience. It is a yes. complete visual novel. It is a complete game. It is adapting only parts of Tsukihime, the original visual novel, but it is a not adapting partial stories. What it does is it takes one half of the roots from that game and it does the complete as fully as you possibly could want articulation of those stories and so it feels complete unto itself if they never finish the other side of red garden that would be very sad but it wouldn't take anything away from this game they've put everything that is kind of unrelated to the vampire stories in the other one and we'll get there eventually and that'll be great on its own terms but a piece of blue glass moon is its own game and it is phenomenal on its own terms yeah absolutely because and that reflects the structure of the original Tsukihime where you had to do the near side roots before you did the far side roots the near side being the blue glass moon ones that are related to the vampire stuff the far side being all the stuff with Shiki's like household and the maids and his sister and all that stuff and so you get like obviously little teases and intimations particularly the early parts of Blue Glass Moon of like what you know there's obviously other things going on with his family and all of that um that this game doesn't address but that that feels like little hooks for a future storyline it is not like oh this got part way through that story and then just stopped um that's not how it is at all so yes it is very much a complete experience. Um, I think a very, very easy one um, to recommend because it is, it's so good. It just, it gets you that, um, you know, that Nasu style. So it's so thick. It's so thick in in Tsukihime. Um, And whether you want the sort of like incredible character drama, whether you want like the huge, crazy action scenes, which are so good. um, It's such a fun evolution from like what the Fate Stay Night visual novel did in the early 20th century, or the early 2000s to like now and how much that has evolved in terms of the technical presentation is awesome because that fight scenes have always been great with these visual novels. Um, But you also just get all the the dumb comedy of the like... um, bad ends and stuff like that. You have uh, yes. Seal Sensei come in and tell you, you know, and have little skits with Neko Arc. You've also got some of my favorite stuff in the game is just Arcade giving you a literal lecture on like the vampires yes, and the those. dead apostles and true ancestors and how all that works because it's the most Nasu ass thing in the world where it's like it takes a thing you think you know, which are vampires, and it just totally blows up that concept and does something crazy different with it. And it's just fun to get the kind of cosmology of this stuff that if you've seen Fate Stay Night or played that game, or if you've, especially if you have watched Garden of Sinners, there's a lot of, you know, overlap between some ideas there. Obviously, Garden of Sinners also has the uh, mystic eyes of, of death perception, not depth, death perception. Um, and there's, you know, that kind of overlap as well. And it's just fun to see that get explored. Obviously, the original Tsukihime did it, but this goes even further. This is like twice as long as the original Tsukihime was, and that had three other roots um, that this one doesn't have. So, 
yeah, it's it's a phenomenal game, top to bottom, and I'm I'm just so thrilled that it, people can fucking play it. You know, it's yes. just it's so crazy to me, and it's so wonderful that just all this stuff is becoming available in English all at the exact same time. When I've been a part of this fan community with for Fate for so long, and it was always this thing that was just impossible to recommend to people for the visual novels, you always had to go. Well, you can watch the anime. Because it's just like, you know, because it's just hard to say, like, to someone who's more casual, well, if you go to this website, you can pirate this game and you have to load it here. And it does this. It's like, uh, no, it's like you don't want to have to do that. It's like, no, you can you have a switch. Do you have a PlayStation? Like, fuck it. You can just buy this thing and play it. It's fine. And it's great. Yeah. And obviously the Switch is like so designed for this. It's it's very mm. much inherited what the Vita was near the end of, you know, or in the 2010s where the Vita became the visual novel machine over in Japan. And now the Switch is doing that. I also want to praise the English translation is fantastic for a Tsukihime, right. a piece of Blue Glass Moon. It is like just, and again, I haven't read it in Japanese, but just knowing Nasu from all the other stuff, I think it is like a very good evocation of his voice it uses language very i think grandly and playfully in the way mm-hmm. he does and it is a markedly better translation than what which on the holy night got which on the holy night was was good it was competent it had a few too many typos uh-huh. it had very weird romanization of the of the main names none of those problems are here i noticed a couple of typos but it's a 50 hour long visual novel i can accept a typo or yeah. two but otherwise, like, I was frequently, like, really impressed with the translation. So no worries there whatsoever. Um, and, yeah, you know, it's also got incredible voice acting from an all-star mm-hmm. cast. It has a giant soundtrack. That, do you know how many discs this is in Japanese for the soundtrack, Sean? Uh, no. How many is it? It's seven. It's a seven-disc <laughs> soundtrack for what is technically one half of a larger remake project. It's insane. Like, the, it's got four full theme songs, including two fully 90-second yes. produced UFO Table pieces of animation, which just, come on, tease us more, UFO Table. Um, oh, my God. It's so good. Yeah. That, that honestly, that's the biggest upgrade from the original Tsukihime is the music. Because the original Tsukihime, you had to fucking put a CD in, and, it, like, and it's a whole archaic other world than that in the original Tsukihime that makes that game weird when you try to like play it on a modern PC um and those tracks are you know terrible and just like some of the musical ideas of those original tracks are fine but the MIDI versions you get are just the most ear-piercing awful little 30 second loops and then you get these really luxurious modern versions oftentimes they brought a lot of the original composers back to redo those original tracks um, and it's so much better. And those tracks are some of my favorite in the whole game um, are the redone versions of the songs from the original Tsukihime where there was like 10 songs or something in that whole game. Um, it's like, it is it is hard to overstate how bad the music is in the original Tsukihime. Um, here, it's great. I listen to the soundtrack every once in a while when I do work um, for this and for Witch on the Holy Night because it's the same overall composer for both those projects. Yeah, it's so good. And the other the last thing I want to say is other than Garden of Sinners, this is the most horror game that they've oh, yeah. Yes. It is true, like, but especially in the Seal Root, it becomes like full body horror. It becomes very Lovecraftian horror at times, you know. And I think Fate Stay Night has horror in it, which on the Holy Night has horror in it. And Garden of Sinners, depending on the episode, is more or less horror. But he is very, very good at horror. And Tsukihime in visual novel form feels like the, the furthest they've pushed that, because boy, is it intense at points yeah it's yeah it is definitely it's like a good october game in that sense yeah. um and yeah and getting into like you know shiki's life is just very fucked up and getting in his head <laughs> it's just like you know yeah. there's a lot of, he's got a lot of shit going on all right but that's Tsukihime. um the only other thing i've played recently is the new zelda uh, echoes of wisdom um but i have not played enough yet to talk about that so i will save that for next month sean do you have anything else to finish our show and tell segment uh, i have one thing on here i'm not actually going to talk about it i'm just going to say it uh i've been watching Bobby tippy piku 